I uh, thank you for the opportunity to share your word. And, uh, you know, this stuff is just always on my heart. And sometimes I can get overpassionate about it. And uh, sometimes I can, um, I just don't know what to say because you, Lord, um, you are at the core of my passion. And so I, I pray and ask for that to be communicated clearly this morning. I, I pray and ask, Lord, that, um, that those who need to be challenged this morning would be challenged. Those who need to be comforted would be comforted. Those who need to be convicted would be convicted. And, um, and that we would all take uh, a step closer to you. Uh, that's really what this is about. And so we pray this in, in your awesome name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you have your Bible, I hope you do, open it up to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I have to make sure. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, how many of you work at a job right now where you work on a team? Like there's a team of you, okay, doing something, okay. How many of you have ever been on a sports team? You can raise your hand, yeah, yeah. Um, t- Tim, thanks, man. <laughs> you, know, you know what's amazing is when you, have, when you have unity on a team, right, and what happens, like, like on your work team or on a sports team, when, when things just begin to flow, it's awesome, isn't it? Um, and, and if you've ever experienced that in sports, and maybe you had a, a, a great team, and just all of a sudden everybody came together, Everybody knew their position. Everybody played their position well. And, and all of a sudden, you just you, you get in the role of things. And, and, and you're scoring. And you're moving ahead. And you're winning games. Uh, and there's, there's just this feeling that when something is working and moving, it's just, it, it feels great. When you're on a, a team at work, and I know in churches we work on teams. I mean, that's pretty much we do everything on teams. And when those teams just get it, and, and all of a sudden, we're, we're unified, and there's this unity on this team, and it's just a, and you're moving, it's just awesome, and you just feel this unity, and this oneness, and, and really, it's, it becomes unstoppable, um, and incredible things happen. You guys ever feel that? I mean, do you ever experience that? Because I love when that happens. I just, I love that. Wh- whether it's sports, whether it's, you know, or maybe you get in a rhythm of life, and you're just like, yeah, it's just a good rhythm right now, you know, and I don't have any rhythm, but, but you know, if I had a drum beat, you know, and you're just, uh, you know, rhythm, and all of a sudden, things are moving, but then when something comes in and destroys that rhythm, right, or, or the team doesn't work as it should, or the sports team starts failing, and then you it just, it's, it just gets so difficult and hard. So I believe that when, when things are in a rhythm and when things have oneness and things have unity, man, they could just be so unstoppable. They could be so powerful in so many ways. Uh, we see this in nature. God created nature to be one, right? I mean, the way the universe works, like there's just this flow and, and, and you know, there's the circle of life. I was going to sing the song, but I was going to spare all of you. Um, that was funny. You guys should laugh. Um, uh, you know, you have the circle of life, and you have, uh, you have the way that God put in existence this system and this process, and, and when it's moving, it's just, oh, all of a sudden, you know, things are being created, and trees are growing, and births are happening, and all these things, and so, so the world is moving at this incredible rhythm, and this incredible flow, and when things work as they're supposed to, it's refreshing, it's whole, as, as they were created. You know, in language, we have uh, the word integrity. And when someone has integrity, they're whole and complete. I, I love that idea of, of the wholeness. It means that they're, they're, not, uh, they're not somebody different somewhere else. When you have integrity, you're the same person, whether I'm standing in front of uh, you here or whether I'm sitting at home with my kids. That's, it. that's, that's integrity. And, and that's where we get the word integer. You know, it's one. But it, but it means this, this complete. It means this whole. Uh, and, and it means a, a, a unity. Somebody who isn't, doesn't have integrity, right? They're more of a hypocrite. They're, they're separated. They're broken because they may be a different person here and a different person there. And so you don't have this, this unity in the person or this integrity or this oneness. You know, we see this in politics, I'm going to talk about politics all day. No, I'm just kidding. 
But right, we see, and we, what are we looking for? We're looking for someone we can trust. We're looking for someone who has oneness or wholeness, that we know what they say is what they, right? That, and, and when we hear that, it's refreshing. And sometimes even if we disagree with it, but we just want to know that someone's being real and honest and true. So how does God, how does this fit with God? And, and when we think about oneness and completeness, how do we correlate that with God? Now, now in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, I'm, hey, we're already there. Check this out. So in Deuteronomy 6, 4, it says this. It says, Hear, O Israel, uh, the Lord our God, uh, the Lord is one. Now, this is the Shema. They would repeat this every day. The Jews would repeat this every day. I, I mean, memorized it, I think, actually four or five times a day. And they would say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then Jesus later add, added, love, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, so I, I want you to catch this because it's important to understand when we talk about uh, foundationally, where are we heading with community? It starts here. It starts in this, this idea of oneness. It starts in this idea of completeness or wholeness. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now that isn't like the numeral one. It's, it's a collective one. And, and it's this word in Hebrew called ichad. And so what, what it's saying is, uh, we know that God is a trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and those in one create a completeness. Okay, it's like a completeness. Now, I'm not going to teach on the Trinity today because we could probably teach 10 or 11 weeks just on this. Uh, so if you have any questions about the Trinity, remember Tim at the Bridge Church US, dot US. He will answer every question you have about the Trinity in five minutes or less. I promise you that. Right, Tim? Yeah, true story. Um, and, and the reason I say that is uh, we can get into the deep theologic uh, you know, deep theology on the Trinity, but we're not going to do that this morning. But I wanted you to get the idea that God is one, and this idea of completeness, and that, that there is nothing more needed, okay? He is, he is who he is, okay? He is who he is. So I'm not going to go through that. But what we have to understand is that his very nature is community, okay? His very nature is community, okay? So just hold on to that as, as we move on. So turn over to Genesis chapter 1 to your left just a little bit. Genesis chapter 1. So you have God as Ichad, right? And meaning this, that, that, that he is this, this trinity, this community. Listen to what happens in Genesis 1. So, so in verse 26 it says this. It says, then God said... Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, okay? And then he says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Uh, male and female he created them. So, so God took his image upon us, the, we're the image bearers of, of God. And so we are not gods, but we have his image. And so we were created, right, as his image bearers. So innately in us, there's this idea of community, that we were created for community. Now let me explain. Let me go a little bit further. Um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Can I hear all the guys say amen to that right now? Amen. That's terrible. Your wife's probably nudging you like, amen. Uh, you should be like great. Yeah, you should be grateful that you even have a wife. I know some of you. And... Uh, holy cow, you should be thanking her, looking at her right now, and kissing her, and come on. No. But it, it's not good for us to be alone. I, and I was just saying this, um, my wife and I, I love you so much, and I'm so grateful for you. And 22 years ago today, I asked her to marry me. So, yep. Isn't that cool? She said yes. Um, we, were, we were at a summer camp with uh, junior high students, she wasn't one, a junior high student. Um, <laughs> just to make that clear. <laughs> and uh, it was an awesome time. Anyway, uh, I just thought I'd share that with you. I get all giddy when I think about, yeah, hey, hey, baby. Um, no, I lost my place. Okay, so, um, so it's not good for us to be alone. And then he says, uh, I will make him a helper fit for him. Verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, which all of us do, hopefully, and they shall become... 
Okay, you guys repeat it with me. One. Everybody say one. Oh, gosh, you're terrible. Okay, let's do it again. Uh, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And that nakedness isn't just physical. There's a spiritual aspect, an emotional aspect to what that means. So they become one flesh. It's the same word. It's sikhat. It's completeness. Right? And, and, and so God, right, creates man and woman not to be alone, right? There's essential this community. And in this community, they're to be one. There's this oneness, right? And, and so when, when two come together, uh, a husband and a wife, uh, it, it's more than just marriage. There is something spiritually happening at that level, which is just absolutely amazing to me. And we're, we're not going to get into all the details, of it, but, but what it's saying is man and uh, husband and wife uh, would reflect the very nature of God. Wow. So your marriage is an illustration to the world of who God is. Because when two come together to be complete and it works, right? That's why we see people married for 60, 70 years. Man, you just go, what? I just, you know, I'm not worried. Like, that's awesome and amazing and crazy. And I praise God for that because that's how it should be. Because that's how God created us to be. That's why adultery, that's why divorce, that's why those other things, when they separate, are so hard and so difficult and so uh, against what God wants for us. And now I know some people are divorced and there's some, and, and there's obviously forgiveness in that, but it hurts and you know it hurts and it's terrible. And that's not the plan, but it happened, and God can obviously still work through it and forgive it, and there's some incredible things that happen out of it. But what I'm saying is, when that oneness comes together, it's so powerful and so strong, it's this completeness. And God is able just to do some incredible work, and so if you're married now, you have that completeness. So God is one, and marriage is one. God is one. That's creepy, huh? <laughs> Something's going on. They're having fun in their, our children's ministry. I hope they're having a blast. Anyway, so God is one, and, and marriage is one. Okay, now turn over to John 17, because Jesus is going to take this a little step further. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Come on. Okay, here we go. So, so here we're, we're going to jump into John 17. What's happening is the cross is, is, is just a few hours away. Um, and Jesus, before he goes to the cross, he's going to begin praying for the believers and for people. So for the church, for you and I. And, and what he desires and what, uh, if we talk about what uh, uh, God's design. And so when we're, we're talking about how he designed community, how he designed us, th this is kind of giving us a glimpse at what he wants to see happen uh, uh, for the people he's about to leave behind, okay? So this is his picture of, of what community looks like. This is his picture of what he's designing for us to live in. And so in John chapter 17, it says this. It says, I do not ask for these only. Speaking of, uh, uh, he's praying for believers. He says, but also for those who uh, believe in me through their word, that they may all be Okay, we got one person. Yeah, okay, let me do that again. That they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us too, so that the world may believe you have sent me. Now, do you catch it? So, so the idea was pointing it towards one. He says, I, I'm desiring that these believers, that they become one. Why? So that the world may know that you sent me. Because how they live together is going to be a witness to the world of who I am. Okay, now it goes on. Uh, verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Okay, did you catch it? This is pretty powerful stuff. So he's saying, when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and the glory that you've given me, they will receive. Okay? That they may be one, even as we are you guys are so modest. One. Okay, that's good. It's good. Um, verse 23. I in them and you in me, that they may become a perfectly one. Let's do that again. That they may become perfectly 
one. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Wow. So Jesus sees the church, he sees community, and he says, he says my idea, right, God's idea for this is that um, just like God is one, just like marriage is one, the community becomes one in purpose, in unity, right, in completeness, right? So, so he draws us together for his purpose and his reasons to accomplish what he's called us to do as one. Man, that's, a, that's an incredible responsibility, incredible responsibility. And so, so what he's basically saying is this, he's saying our faith leads to unity. So when we come together, our faith leads to unity, which leads others to faith. Do you catch that? So when we believe and we come together, there's faith in our unity, that the faith leads to unity, right? When we believe the same things, we come together, we have this unity, and we're moving forward. And because of that unity, as we move forward, as a church, as the church, people will see that unity and come to faith. That is a huge, huge responsibility for each and every one of us in this room. Huge responsibility. And so do you see the picture here? God is one, marriage is one, the church is one. The, the marriage and the church, are, are, they reflect the very nature of who God is. Which I, I think is an amazing thing. Because let's just be honest, when you see a church doing what it's called to do, it's irresistible. When you see a community of people sold out for Jesus Christ, and they're working in the gifts that God has given them, and they're moving forward in a community, and they're reaching out, and they're, and they're, they're looking for lost people to bring in. You can't stop that. That's God's design. Let's, let's move forward. I'm going to explain this a little deeper. Uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 1 to your right. Ephesians chapter 1. i got to get a drink of water here real quick. Mm. Mm. Much better. Ephesians chapter 1. This is one of my favorite. I love Ephesians. It's all about the church. This is one of my favorite sections of scripture. Um, look at what it says in Ephesians 1 verse 22. It says this. It says, and, and he put, who's he? Okay, good. He put all things under his feet. Who's his? Jesus. And gave him, who's him? Jesus. As head over all things to the church. Yeah, we know that, right? Jesus is the head of the church. But look at verse 23. Head over all things to the church. The church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ooh. So what is the church's responsibility? To be the hands and feet of Jesus on this earth. Right? To be the living example of who God is to the community around us, to the world around us. So, so in, 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 in God's economy, in God's picture, in God's structure, in God's kingdom, he's, he goes in and he says, hey, I'm going to pull apart, I'm going to set apart a group of people called the church, and I'm going I'm to give them the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to unleash them into the world to seek and save that which was lost so it can be found. And I'm gonna, they're going to serve and love and care. And you know what? They're going to turn the world upside down because they're going to live different from the world. They're going to love the weak. They're going to love the unlovable. They're going to they're gonna heal brokenness. They're gonna, and he gives that to us. Wow. And he says, this blows me away. The church is his body. That word fullness of him who fills all in all. That word fills. It's the, the picture is this. If I have a balloon and I blow it up, at that point it's just about to explode. There's no more room left, right? That's what fills mean. It means this. It means the fullness of him who fills all in all. It fills it up. It fills the world that God said, I'm, the church is the hope of the world. You are the hope of the world. Man, we are the hope of the world, guys. Everything in every way that God prides for us. Now, Scoot down to Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 10. So a little bit further. So then he describes a little bit deeper. And I love this. Listen to what he says. He says, for we, we are his workmanship. I think I've taught on this before here, but I, I, have to, I had to bring it up again. For, for we are his workmanship. And the idea is this, right? You guys, like, 
like the church is his piece of work. Like we, like we're his best thing. Like when, when, he, when, when he created all this, when he said, okay, I'm going to design how this is all going to work, the church, that's it. Man, that's my A game right there. I'm bringing the best. I'm going to bring these people together, and they're going to move, and they're going to share, and all of a sudden things are, and, and that's what he says here. He says, look, I, that's my workmanship. That word in, in Greek is poema. It's a poem. It's a masterpiece. It's like he worked on it, and he, he massaged it just perfectly so that it would be amazing. And then he says this, so for we are his workers who have created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And, and the whole point is this, is that he didn't create in us to be this awesome thing just so we sit around. <laughs> or, or just so we can hear a great talk and then go home and, 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 and live life and, and then come back next Sunday and do the same thing and then and the world's going to hell. And that's not what he created it for. He created it to change communities, to change worlds, to change lives. And we're in the midst of it. So God brought us together to accomplish his purpose on earth. And when we're one, when we're unified, when we're working together, and we, and we have the same mind, it doesn't mean we agree on everything because we're not going to agree on everything. We're people. But we agree on the things that matter. And we go and we individually, God gave us what we need to accomplish our purposes in the church. It's unstoppable. It's unstoppable. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 18. And he says this. I'll read it from here. It says, uh, actually, verse 19. Uh, he says, uh, So then, uh, you are no longer strangers and aliens. Uh, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, now stop there, because when we read that, we go, oh yeah, of course we're family. But what we forget is this book was written to the church in Ephesus. The church of Ephesus, and the Gentiles were starting to come to the church. People uh, who didn't belong came to the church. Uh, we know that there were slaves at the church. And, and slaves back then um, were way different. Slaves, mostly in, in the Roman culture, were, were people that were disregarded. Babies that were thrown out to die, and someone came and saved them, and set them apart, and adopted them, to, so they would become a lifelong slave for them. And, and, and here Paul's saying, hey, I want you to know something. You belong. You be even though your parents got rid of you, you belong. Even though Gentiles, you were never accepted by the Jews, you belong. Even that, that's what he's saying. And you are fellow citizens with the saints. You're members of the household of God. saying you are family. You belong. Isn't it the greatest thing to walk? You know, I have some friends where you walk into their house and their family just accepts you and you feel like you're family. And there's just this, all of a sudden, this incredible bond. Isn't it the worst thing to walk into somebody else's house and their family totally rejects you? And you walk in, and, and they're got doing their own thing, and, and, and you're maybe coming over for Thanksgiving, and they invited you, but they all talk, and they kind of ignore you, and it's the worst possible environment. And the church is a family where no matter where you come from, no matter where your background, that God's like, I adopted you. I chose you. And because I chose you, you belong. Like, you belong. I belong. So that's... That's the church at Ephesus. And then he says this. He goes even deeper. He goes this in verse 20. He says, so, so he said, the members of the household of God, he said, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into the holy temple of the Lord. Now, why is this so important? Because the temple for the Jews was the place of worship. I mean, that's the place where God dwelt. That's the only place where God dwelt. And so the, Paul's rocking their world, the Jews that are in the room, and he's saying, hey, look, look at what I'm doing. Jesus is the cornerstone of this new building we're building, and, and basically, look, uh, and this whole structure is being joined together. Look in the next verse, verse 23. Uh, it says this, in him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I'm gonna use the church and my spirit's going to work through you guys, you, us, here, now. This is for us today. Christ is the cornerstone, and he works through the church. And he, that's, that's his plan. Sometimes I go, God, that's a terrible plan. Like, really? Because we're, I can't imagine we're doing a great job. 
because I'm a perfectionist. But he's like, nope, that's my plan. And I'm going to build this up, and I'm going to build you guys, and I'm going to use you in an incredible way. So God created the church to be his hands and feet. Now, let, let me tell you something. I, I'm, let me tell you what the church is not. The church is not this building. This is a great building. We're, we have an incredible uh, children's ministry. Um, we have a nice big room. We've got, but, you know, when we go to heaven, uh, this building won't be there. Praise Jesus. Right? When, when you step up there, it's not like all of a sudden there's going to be this building. This, this is not the church. Okay? This building houses the church. It's a tool for the church to meet in. You are the church. You and I, together, in unity, towards a purpose, are the church. Right? And so you have this picture. The church is not, the church is not our programs. Guys, we have some awesome programs. And, and, pro, and I'm a program guy. I love systems and projects. I'm like, you know what? If someone moves here, and then I want to move here, 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 and then they become a fully devoted disciple. And God's like, yeah, that's really funny. It doesn't work quite that way. But I think it does. And, I, and you do have to have some kind of processes, of course. But here's the idea. The, the church can exist without our programs. If the persecution came today, and we were shut down, what would you do? Oh, I can't go to church. If you say I can't go to church because there's no, then you're missing the point of church because this, this building isn't it. It's you. It's me. We are the church. The church is not your paid staff. You know, Tim, me, Nate, Dee, all the other paid staff. We're, we're, you know what our responsibility is? Is to equip the saints for ministry. To create a place so the church goes out into the world. To create a place so we can come, learn, and be discipled so that we can go out into the world. That's a huge responsibility. The church is the people. Man, the church is you. God said, this is my masterpiece. You can look in the mirror when you get home and say, I'm a masterpiece. I, like, God, that was a joke, so... But, but really, this is, like, I am a master, like, like, God created this and designed this to be a masterpiece. So we have this picture of the church is one, marriage is one, and God is one. Uh, turn over to Matthew uh, 28 to your left. Are you guys tracking with me here? Okay. So, so Jesus then, so Jesus is, he's, he, he, he comes and lives on this earth. And he doesn't live like a king, right? I mean, how does he live? He, he lives like a normal person to show us how to live, to show us what to do, to be an example or an illustration of his life, to say this this is how I want you to live. And what does he do? What does he do? For 30 years, he doesn't do anything. You're like, oh, great, cool. I'm not 30 yet. I don't have to do anything. But really, for 30, and then he starts his incredible ministry. And he spends his time with 12 guys and basically invests everything in these 12 guys. Can you believe that? And you and I are here today because of it. So, so, so Jesus invested in this community, and he, and he showed them, he showed them a different way to live, right? Instead of rejecting people, he said, care for people. Um, instead of kicking someone when they're broken, he said, let's heal someone who's broken. Uh, in, in, instead of just listening to uh, the religious people of the day and agreeing with what they say, he challenged them to look at the heart, at the relationship, not the knowledge. You see, he, he transformed their lives, and then he leaves them and says, I want you to do the same. That's his plan. And those guys are the reason why we are here. Can you believe that? Twelve. And yeah, a lot, and Paul, and a lot of, obviously, God moving through other ways, but 
but he showed us how he wants to torture. Now listen to Matthew 20. So he leaves, and as he leaves, he's saying, hey, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do. And he says this in Matthew 28, verse 18. So Jesus came to them. And you know what's interesting? Before this, I think it's in 16 or 17, it actually says that some doubted. Some of the guys doubted what he was doing. I just thought that was interesting. Verse 18, he says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Like, this is it. I'm the guy. And he says, Go. Verse 19 gives them a command, and he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. He says, go and make disciples, go and baptize people. You know, a lot of people say that's, that's that verse, and I always believe that it was as you go, but it's not. It's go. There's no as you go. It's, it's a command to go, to go into the world and make disciples. Now, now, here's the thing. A lot of us are good at being disciples. A lot of us are really good at that, because I could be a disciple. You know, I can learn, and, and I'm comfortable, and I can come to church every Sunday, and I can enjoy it. And there's, obviously, that's what we want to be doing. But the command was to go and make disciples. And in order for you to make disciples, obviously, you have to be a disciple. But the, the goal at the end of that is to make disciples. And Jesus put that challenge out. He says, guys, the, the, the church... I'm putting you on earth for a purpose and a reason. This, so this oneness, right, and that oneness is to go and create these communities that make disciples. And, uh, and that's the designer's design. So let me highlight some of these. Here's the designer's design. As God is one, marriage is one, and the church is one. And the church is one. The church exists to be the hands and feet of Jesus as I get it, it's easy, it's easy to be Jesus to the people in this room or the people that we know. Because it's easy to love those who love us back. It's the hardest thing to love those who don't love us. Or reject us. And that's exactly who he desires us to be. Now again, that's, I'm not trying to put a burden I'm to, what I'm trying to do is, is, depending upon your gifts and talents and what God has put you, what part of the body, that you are a part of that, a very important part of that. So how this illustrates is this, is, to be honest, it's a parking lot out here. I started a parking lot ministry, and I went out there for about four weeks, tried to, tried to recruit some people, and, and I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. I get it. <laughs> We're out there doing a great time, and I, I, and I was praying and hoping that somebody would see this as their, their witness opportunity and their, their tool to be able to use a gift because maybe they're not doing anything. And we made a cry out to people and said, hey, I'd love for you to help. And some people came, you know, kind of just fell apart. That's partly my leadership in not, um, in not getting people. But here's, here's what it would be awesome. Like if someone saw that and said, you know what, I want to greet every single person that parks their car and make sure that before they even walk through their doors that they feel loved and cared for. Because that's what the church does. Holy cow. And that's, that takes no, you don't have to have a, a seminary degree. All you have to do is have a smiling face and a handshake. That's all you have to do. And you know what? It's eternally life-changing for someone. That's amazing. And that's being Jesus to the world. The designer's design, the church would live in community. That the church would be a community and live in community. This is why I believe life groups are imperative to what we do. Now again, life groups aren't the end, they're just a tool. Right? There are other ways. But we've agreed and we've said, what is the best way we can do community? And the best way we feel we can do community in our culture and our time is to say, you know what, Sunday morning isn't enough. And that we need to be in a place of community in a smaller environment where someone knows my name and I know their name. Where, man, if I have questions, that the group is able to talk through those. If I have doubts, if I'm hurting, I can get prayer. If there's something I need to know, I can go and find the answer there. If there's, if, if, if there's a struggle, then I know that that's a safe place for me to build community, right? That's, 
That's the picture. And so as those things are happening, we become one. And for those of you who life groups have been around for years, right, you know this, you're already, you, you feel like there's this synergy and this oneness and this flow, and you're like, I like this. It works. And that's how God designed it. But it doesn't end there, guys, because the purpose and reason he designed it was so that the world would see who he is through us. Not for us just to stay together. You can't live in community on Sunday. I, this is great, but man, what if you're like, that's the worst sermon I ever heard. That guy, Bill, he's terrible. Who are you going to talk to about it? Talk to Tim. Um, but really, where are you going to talk about if you have questions? I disagree with that, or I agree with that. In a community. And you don't rip on, you know, I hope I didn't open up a can of worms with that, but <laughs> you guys are all, that was the worst thing I ever heard. When you're falling apart, because it, it, it's not if it happens, it's when it happens. Who's going to surround you? Who's going to be there at your hospital bed? Who's going to be there when you get the test results? And, and here's what happens. It's often too late. We go, oh, I'm hurting. Now I'm going to get into community. <laughs> and, and that's tough. But if you're already in community, and you've already walked with people through their hurts, and all of a sudden, now it's, you're hurting, then you have the support that you don't get anywhere else. A lot of you know this. You're, you, you've experienced that, and some of you haven't. The designer's design is the way we live in community with each other is a picture to the world of what God is like. Ah, oh, guys, I can't say how... You meeting in a life group, and some of the stuff we're going to be doing in the, in the fall and, and a little later is, is working together to serve your immediate area, wherever that life group meets, or a community, or a family. And, and imagine the, your life group coming together and saying, hey, there's this family that just needs our support right now, and so we're going to take care of them. Maybe even around Christmas time, you, you create a Christmas for that, that whole family because they don't have any money, and you go buy them a tree, you go buy them all their food for their Christmas dinner, you buy their kids all their gifts. Man, that's, the world sees that and goes, who does that? Who does that? Who does that? The church does that. Those in community well, the designer's design is that those in community would grow and mature to be like Jesus, and he was more interested in what they did than what they knew. And so there's always a challenge, right, to take what we have. Everything we learn has to be lived out in community. You can't do it outside of community. Uh, classes are great, but you can't learn that way. You have to learn within community where people are holding you accountable. And, and so it moves together. Um, the designers design that those in community would go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. Now, let me, I'm going I'm to close off with a couple of things here. And, and here's what I want to close off is. If this is true, you guys, if this is true, and I'm, I mean, if this is true, and I believe it is, I believe the best possible way for you to, ex to the best possible life for you to experience is in community. Like, it really is. Like, if God, okay, if we really look and say God is community, God designed marriage as community as a picture of one, and the church as community as a picture of one, that we're headed toward, then, then the best possible life I could live right now is that I'm in community, experiencing what God has for me, experiencing what that looks like, experiencing him and others in the way I'm supposed to. And, and we would see that as a life group. Um, if this is true, then Sunday morning is not enough. Now, it's, and what I mean by that is, yes, incredible things happen on Sunday morning. We, agree, we come together, we get to learn together, we see our friends, we get to celebrate what God's been doing. And there's a, there's a, a level of learning that happens that's very powerful, but it's not enough. And serving is not enough. Because I could be serving and I could be on Sunday, but if I'm not known anywhere and I'm not connected anywhere, then I'm missing out on the community that God has for me. Um, God created you and I to be relational, to give and receive in relationship with others. And this is so powerful. 
Uh, this is for you introverts too. I, I know some of you are like, I'm introvert. I'd just rather sit at home by myself. And maybe you start a group of maybe five or six, not, you know, too big. But you guys, even if you're an introvert, no one alone. You can't be alone. Let me share with you my dad. My, my dad, um, he, he was that guy. I mean, he wasn't a Christian, and um, he bought a house out in the middle of the desert, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, because he wanted to be alone. And all he had was his dog. And when he had cancer, uh, he didn't even tell anybody. And I found out, I went out, and I saw him, and uh, he was going to die, and so I stayed with him the whole time as the process as he went through dying. And, and you guys, it was heartbreaking. Not only because he's my dad, but he had, no, but he had one friend, and that friend just wanted his stuff. Um, and he's out in the middle of the desert, and the only thing he cared for was his dog. On his deathbed, the thing he cried out for, not for his family, not for his friends, not for God, it was his dog. And you know how heartbreaking that is? And, and I just imagine, I, I, I pictured if he would have had a community around him, if he would have had the church around him and surrounded him. Oh. We can't do it alone. So what's your next step? I have four, four options for you. If you're someone who's never been in a life group, and it sounds scary, I get it. We talked about this last week. It's not on your bucket list. You're like, life group, it sounds creepy, freaky. I, don't, I, I get it. I totally get it. I understand. I was that guy. I wanted to just leave me alone. And you know what? It's life-changing. Here's what I'm going to say to you. Your next step is to get connected. Your next step is to jump in. Your next step is to say, you know what, I know how I feel, but I trust and understand that God knows better. And like a cannonball, you know, like when you go to a pool and you see that water's going to be cold, I don't know if I'm going to do it or not, you, and you say, I'm going to cannonball it. And you just run and you wrap your legs and you dive in and it hurts and it's freezing. That's what you got to do. You just got to jump in. You just got to jump in because there's no other way. You can't ease your way into it. And you got to say, I got to give it all I have and I got to make it work. Because if God designed it this way, then it's the best possible way for you to live. So if you're someone who hasn't made that decision, then, then, then that's what you have to do. Maybe, maybe you've, you've served at the church, you've been in Bible studies, but you never gave it a shot. And you're like, hey, I'm connected here. I, I know people. But you don't really know people, and people don't really know you. But you kind of know them, right? You, you, know, you know who you are, because it's, it's easy to, to get lost in a group this big. So we think people think we're connected, but we're really not. Do people know your stuff? Because if they don't, then you need to find a place for that to happen. Well, then you need to jump in. You need to cannonball it too and say, you know what? I need to take my next steps. Maybe you're, you're someone who's quit the idea of community. It's too hard. It takes too much time. Maybe you got burned. Your schedule's crazy. I don't know. There's a million excuses you can have. And, and you know what? I get this. But your next step is to trust and have faith in God and say, you know what? Okay, I'm going to do this. Because I know it's the best possible way for me to live. And I know that I'm going to need to be connected. Maybe you're in a life group now. And I know there's, there's some of you that, that are in awesome life groups and things are going great. And maybe your next step is to lead out and to branch off your group. And the reason is not for you. Because maybe there's a group that needs a leader like you because you've experienced a great life group for many years and you could have so much value into helping this group experience a community they've never experienced. And so you have to lay aside what you get the benefit from so that somebody else can experience it. I'm not saying that's easy, easy that's hard. But man, that is a good place to be. So starting on September 11th, we are, we are launching life groups into our fall season. Um, so this next four weeks, we are five weeks, we're going to be taking sign-ups. And so this is what I want you to do. This is what I want to challenge you to do. Is talk with your spouse if you're married and say, hey, how are we going to make this work? How are we going to fit this in our schedule? Um, and next week, come with questions or look at what we have and get signed up. Um, if you're single, 
get with some of your friends and say, hey, can you do this with me? Let's just, and maybe you want to start a life group together. That would be awesome. And I'll supply you with all the resources you need and the training you need. Or if you don't have any friends, come see me. I will be your best friend. I would love to talk with you. I would love to get you connected. I would love to help you take those next steps. Wherever you're at, we need to move you forward. We need you moving to take your next step. So spend this week praying, and then be ready to jump in. Bring your swim trunks next week. Cannonball it. I don't care. No, don't do that. That would look funny. Um, but be ready to jump in. Amen? All right, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to this awesome group of people and, and to challenge, be challenged at where you're leading and guiding us. Lord, I know... I know your heart's desire is that we would be as one as you are one. And so help us to do that. Help us to, to, to move towards that. And, and the reason is, Lord, because there are so many lost people in our valley that don't know you. And what we don't realize is that when we live in community, we live how you've called us to live in those places that it's irresistible. It is just irresistible. We pray this in your name. Amen.